Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce David Molnar from Berkeley, and who's going to talk about security and privacy in the RFID. So, right. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Molnar, and I'm going to talk to you today about some work I've done with Andrea Sapera from British Telecom and my advisor, David Wagner. So first of all, just to set the stage, what is an RFID? The term refers to radio frequency identification. And usually when we talk about RFID, we think of a little tiny chip called a tag that has an antenna. And very often it's passive. It doesn't have a power supply of its own, but it gets power from the reader. And so we think of tagging one tag for every item, one tag for every pallet, one tag for every person. So RFID applications, well, they're everywhere. Uh, just to show you some things up here, we have transit cards. This is in London, where people are using contactless smart cards to pay for their trips every day. This is in library books, where over 200 libraries in North America alone are using a tag on every single book to keep track of inventory and do automatic check-in and check-out. The top is Fast Track, which uh, you may be familiar with. It's an automatic toll payment system. Uh, and then on the top right, we have Chase banking cards, where now you don't even have to swipe a magnetic strip. You just wave your card, and it debits your account for you. Uh, we have Prius key fobs, which unlock your car from three feet away while the key fob is inside your luggage. True story. We have electronic passports. And on the top, right hand, top left hand side, we have uh, student IDs that were actually rolled out in an elementary school just northwest of Sacramento. Uh, and the little tiny white box you can't really see on the doorway is a little reader that keeps track of when people enter and leave. Yes? Yes, actually, my friend Annalie Nowitz had an RFID implanted in her arm as part of a demonstration of a cloning attack, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and actually, at the Baja Beach Club in Barcelona, uh, certain patrons had RFIDs implanted to act as payment devices. It, it turns out that if you are a young woman and you're going out in the town, you're not wearing enough to have pockets. And uh, <laughs> uh, so jewelry is okay, but you can't pay for a drink with your jewelry, at least not more than once. So they had a VIP. <laughs> they had a VIP program where they implant a chip in your hand, and you'd wave your chip across the bar. Oh, I mean, you can't wear a bracelet. You know what I mean? Oh yes, of course you could wear a bracelet, but. They didn't. You have to remember to put it on. So one of the things I want to get across before we get into discussion, and I think this will help clarify the issue. So people always talk about RFID can do this, RFID can't do that. One of the problems in this space is that the term RFID refers to a whole range of technologies. And they have very different properties in terms of how far they can be read, how much computation is possible, and basically what kind of crypto and security things we have to work with. So this is a little. Uh, graph that's trying to get across some idea of the range. So on the top left-hand corner, we have devices which are intended to be read from about 10 centimeters away and happily happen to have a lot of computation. So the devices used in an electronic passport, for instance, can support uh, digital signatures. They can support encryption. Whether or not that gets used is a completely different question. But they can, have the, they can support it. And transit cards, for instance, use encryption and mutual authentication to prevent other people from you know, impersonating the transit authority. In the middle case, we have uh, car keys, library books, where you can read them from about a half a meter to a meter away, but they don't have as strong encryption. They, they can support a stream cipher or something home brewed, but they can't support a standard encryption algorithm. Yes, that has a lot to do with it. Yes? Could this support Shamir's uh, PKP? Uh, Could it support Adi Shamir's PK, uh, permuted kernel problem? I don't know. I don't know. There are a couple of startups that are looking at things like that. There's one that's trying to use um, some uh, 
group key agreement stuff, like the Bray group stuff, those people are working on uh, RFID-based uh, crypto for that kind of class. And on the far right-hand side, we have things like what Walmart has used for its pallet and uh, supply chain tracking and what was used in these student IDs, where all it does is it's kind of like a digital license plate. It returns a number, and that's about it. And it has very little uh, computation available for any kind of cryptography. So I mentioned intended read range. And so the intended read ranges differ. But the thing to keep in mind is the adversary can always build a better reader. And there's also several different ranges that people will need to think about. So one is the direct read range. So this is important because a lot of these devices get their power from the reader. And because of that, in order to power the device, you often need to be quite close. So in the case of the passports, for instance, because they support so much computation, you need to be about 10 centimeters close to power them reliably. On the other hand, if it's already hmm? extendable. Yes, exactly. It's demonstrated to be quite extendable. I, I, but on the other hand, if you're eavesdropping, if the device is already powered, then in the passport case and other cases, it turns out you can be much farther away. And we're starting to see some data points available. So for instance, the electronic product code, the Walmart tags, there was a demonstration in 2005 of reading them at 63 feet away, directly reading them. And then in e-passports, uh, there's been eavesdropping at at least four meters, possibly more, and then reading at over 25 centimeters. So there's been a lot of work here. And the, the key point to take away is read range is not a security measure here. Just because someone says, oh, it's a short read range, that doesn't make it a secure device. And in fact, even a short read range is uh, enough to cause trouble. So let me share with you a little personal story. All right? I was involved in some art public policy regarding RFID in California. And as part of it, I got the, had the pleasure of working with some wonderful lobbyists from the RFID industry who continually said that um, you know, it's a short read range. It's no problem. It's no problem. It turns out that the. Uh, Swipe cards used in the capital are vulnerable to a kind of cloning attack. If I can get close to you and read your card, I can make a copy of it. So I personally took a little reader into the capital in last August and uh, got about nine people just by bumping into them. So Avi Rubin, who's a security consultant, has a very nice quote about this. He likes to say it's like pickpocketing, except you don't actually have to touch the person. And it's the same thing that happens here unless certain privacy protections are put in place. Do you mean like eavesdrop and then transmit it farther you know, later on? Later yes. On, so be close by and then sort of... Yes. And there's at, least, there's at least two groups, one in Cambridge University in the UK and one in Tel Aviv University who are trying to do that experimentally right now. And, and that's a... So the, the, the question was, can you eavesdrop and then relay the signal further away? And the answer is yes, in principle, and there are some people working on that. Uh, so one thing that, you know, we've talked about the read range, the thing you should ask next is, okay, what's on these tags? Well, why do I care if someone's reading my tag? Generally, there's a minimum of a unique identifier. So you can think of it as some kind of a license plate. And the actual identifier changes. So library books have a barcode. Walmart has this electronic product code, which is like the universal product code you see with today's barcodes. But it goes to a unique item instance. It's not just this is a can of beans. It's this is this fifth can of beans that was shipped to Walmart from this place at this time. And building access cards, like the ones that many people use, at least have a unique ID number to tell you apart from your friend who shouldn't be in that door. But what it turns out is that many applications have more. So electronic passports, because they have to work anywhere in the world, have your photograph, your full name, and your birth date, among other things. And credit card number, credit cards have, turns out that they have your full name and your credit card number. So why is this important? Well, skimming is an issue, right? Because RFIDs don't tell you when they're being read, there's an issue about can someone read it without my knowledge? And this is a particular concern the tag is carrying something like my photograph, which will then be used to, uh, as a part of comparing me against the document. Or, as was shown recently by researchers from University of Massachusetts Amherst, credit cards. So these people, wonderful people from University of Massachusetts and RSA, took a look at 20 of the most recent RFID credit cards from different issuers, including American Express, MasterCard, and Visa. These companies had claimed that there's no privacy problem because all your data would be stored encrypted. There's no problem. You shouldn't worry about it. Please use these cards and spend more money. 
Well, it turns out that's not true. It turns out that in all 20 of these cases, all of these cards sent the full name and the credit card number. And they were able to take the credit card number, sniff from one of these cards, and then order stuff over the internet with it. Yes? If I remember right, none of the credit cards today have yet, have yet to use public key crypto. So even when they're saying crypto, they mean 1960s technology encryption. Have they changed here? Uh, well, in my experience, trying to decipher what credit card companies mean when they say we use 128-bit encryption is a lost cause. Uh, there are standards that, your, that uh, MasterCard and Visa have worked on that would use public key crypto, but to my knowledge, they have not been deployed in the United States. I don't know about Europe. So you're saying they're sending plain text? Yes, they're sending plain text. But how can they even claim that it's secure? They can claim, but they, they have PR people. They can claim anything they want. <laughs> it's based on proximity. Yes. Uh, if, they, if you push them, so. Before there, this report came out, they said, oh, it's all encrypted, therefore there's no problem. After the report came out, they said, oh, 98% of the cards are encrypted. You just got the ones that weren't. Oh, and by the way, you, know, you aren't liable for any problems that happen if your card is stolen, which may be true, is true, but uh, it would be nice to say that beforehand instead of lying about what encryption was used. So what you have there on the right there is Senator Charles Schumer from New York. And uh, he went onto the street in Manhattan two days ago holding up RFID credit cards to tell people about this issue and is now calling for a sort of truth in labeling when it comes to security and RFID credit cards. So this has actually been the news recently. Uh, and all because, you know, s yes? You heard the, on the Apple, uh, Nike, uh, RFID, did you hear about that? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. And I'm glad you asked that question because we're going to see a screenshot soon. Uh, so skimming, just before that, I just want to mention, so skimming gets into this issue about cloning. So if you have an RFID device and all it does is send a unique ident identifying number, and that's all it does, it becomes quite easy to make a clone, that is, a device that looks to the reader just like the RFID card. And this has been demonstrated over and over again. Uh, so the Vera chip is a human implantable RFID. You put it in your arm, and then you can scan your arm to prove that you're you. At least that's the sales pitch. It turns out it's quite easy to clone this and make a device that replays the same number. So a friend of mine, her name's Anna Lee, she had one implanted by the company. And then she got this other fellow, Jonathan West Hughes, to come on up and scan her arm and then make a clone of her very chip. It's been done for car key fobs, and there, there was cryptography used, but it turned out to be weak. It turned out to be something that uh, was a stream cipher, it could be fairly easily reverse engineered, and uh, it turned out to have a 40-bit key. Oops. Uh, but the, one of the more interesting things from my point of view recently is building access cards. Not every building access card has this property, but many of them do. And in fact, the cards that we use at UC Berkeley, the student ID cards, have this property. All they are is a simple unique identifier. And all that happens when you get into a door is the door reader looks at it and says, oh, you're, the, um, you're on my approved list. I'll let you in. These are trivial to clone. It's been done at least twice. So John and West Hughes did it in 2003. MIT Radio Society did it in 2004. And uh, I've done it. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to. Hmm? Before or after the others? After these guys. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was part of a demonstration in California. Uh, and I'm not going to try it on your Microsoft ID cards because I want to not get thrown in jail. So, But the thing about this cloning risk is it violates an assumption a lot of people have that RFID is unique. So if you talk to people in the pharmaceutical industry, some of them have this amazing idea that just because there's a chip, it's impossible to clone. Uh, certain lobbyists have this understanding as well. And the problem with the cloning issue is that because they're being used to authenticate high value items like people or pharmaceuticals, even a short read range is a problem because all you have to do is get close to the item once and then you can clone it. So all I have to do is get close to you once and then I can come in as you after hours. And this is a concern because people design their systems assuming this is unique. Yes? Is there even Assumption that I have to get close to it in, in the first place. Uh, I, many of the systems I'd seen see, seem to be the case that you could guess a valid RFID tag. That's correct. You don't that's even have to. You just have to be able to clone something. That's correct. Or you know, just keep trying different ID numbers. They're quite short usually. Yes. 
uh, if I remember the inverse square law right, uh, the read rate depends on the power of the transmitter. Yes. And basically, if 5 watt get you some distance, 5 megawatt get you a slightly bigger distance. Yes, that's correct. And people have actually started doing some of that work. Like the, the work from the people at Tel Aviv have simulated how far out that curve goes, and then they've started actually building things along those lines. And it doesn't go as far as the moon? <laughs> uh, not, not that they've done so far experimentally. No. The longest range I know for building access cards is about two feet. The MIT guys claim about two feet, which is enough to have a doorway that records and clones everyone walking through it. So the thing is, if you happen to be a cryptographer, you'll probably be thinking right now, gee, you know, there are ways around this. There are ways to fix this problem. But unfortunately, they're not being deployed. Or if they're being deployed, as in the car key fobs, they're using insufficient cryptography. But one thing that happens, even if you use cryptography, is often there's a unique identifier per RFID that anyone can pick up. And so this leads to a tracking issue. Anyone can track. And so we had a question from the audience about a recent work done at University of Washington where uh, these Nike plus iPod kits, I don't know if people have seen them. They're, they consist of a little sensor that goes in your shoe, and it talks to your iPod, and it tells you how many steps you've taken. So you can use it to plot your workout. Unfortunately, it won't talk only to your iPod. It'll talk to my iPod, and his, and his, and his. And what it gives you is a unique identifier. So you can think of it like a license plate. It follows your shoe everywhere the shoe goes. And what these people did uh, was they built a little system that would actually track these identifiers around town. So this is an actual screenshot from their work. And I'm sorry, it uses Google instead of Microsoft, but it's all right. And you can get the uh, paper and some more information from there. A variant of this, which is actually more concerning to me, is something I like to call hot listing. So in the tracking, you have a bunch of unique identifiers. And maybe later on you figure out who they are. Maybe you don't. But in hot listing, you only care about a few specific people or a few specific items. And let me give you a real world example. Uh, in 2003, the FBI put out a warning to its agents saying, we want people with almanacs. Because people with almanacs might be terrorists looking to blow up specific locations in the United States. I'm not making this up. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so for a while, the FBI wanted to know anyone with an almanac. That's the hot list that they had. Now, a hypothetical hot list. If I set up an RFID reader at a gun show or a political rally, I can get a list of all the IDs that were at that gun show or political rally. These are all legal, but it's also quite interesting to know who's there. Later on, I can compare an RFID against the list and say, oh, was that person at the gun show? I don't have to know their name, but now I know where they were. I know that they're on my list of people I'm interested in. Now, there was a uh, slightly more out there uh, version of this attack that actually showed up on primetime TV recently. Bob Saget was in an episode of Law and Order Special Victims Unit. So that's uh, the actress that was playing his wife, and he thought that she was cheating on him. So in the Law and Order episode, he implants her with an RFID. And then he keeps track of readers around you know, his friends' homes. And then he doesn't care about any other ID. He only cares about if she's going into his friend's place. Uh, and it all ends in tears, but you can watch the video for that. <laughs> but why do you have the RFID? Why not just a cell phone? Um, to track kids, etc., using uh, cellular technology, or all the devices for it. So it turns out it might be illegal to track people by cell phone. It, there is a wiretap statute that may or may not be interpreted in such a way as, say, civilians tracking others by cell phone is illegal. I've asked the same question. I've thought about building such a device myself. But there are no rules of RFID. There, there's just no rules yet. Uh, perhaps that's the case. We, maybe we need more rules, or perhaps it's the case we need to fix the technology. That's a different question. Um, now, one thing that also comes up is, you know, is it, do all the problems go away because it's only a number? And, and the answer is no. So first of all, cloning is still a problem. If I can guess your, stu your student or employee ID, I can often clone a tag if there's no other problems. Tracking is still a problem, and hot listing is still a problem. And I think, and I hope that I can convince you, that these are still issues that we have to worry about, or at least should be aware of before we implement RFID systems. Because, uh, as we just heard 
from this question and answer, there's no rules about who can or can't eavesdrop on these things. In California, it's legal for me to skim your RFID without telling you, as far as I can tell. Uh, it's legal for me to make a clone of your RFID as long as I don't use it to break into a building. So the other thing that comes up is these databases exist somewhere that map IDs to names or IDs to other information. Otherwise, there would be no point to this technology. Who says that database won't be sold to someone? Uh, who says that I won't create a parallel database of my own and then sell it to you? So here's a real world example. License plates. If you go to reverse license plate lookup and you type that into your favorite search engine or you, you, know, you take a look at any of these um, private detective sites, they will sell you the name and address of a license plate you give them for a very minimal amount of money. Some of them make you fill out a form that gives a good reason and others don't. Yes? It's different from uh, did, uh, people carrying a credit card. I, my information is in a credit company database. I, anyway, I need to trust them somehow. Well, it, it's the same thing, right? With the credit card, what you're giving up is your purchase information, which is sensitive. But here, the question is about your location information. Where did you go? Who did you talk to? That kind of thing. And the other issue is notice, right? So with the credit card, you know that the information is being collected, and you have the opportunity to review it at the end of every billing period. Here, I can sniff your RFID and you'll never know. You'll never have an opportunity to figure out what's going on there. If you're going someplace that you don't want people to know you, where you are, you might decide to pay cash. Exactly. But you don't have that opportunity if you can wait. You know, oh, I mean, the RFID must have an off button. No, it oh. doesn't. There's no off button. No, should add code. No button at all. Covered. No. The, in, it, you can build RFID with an off button, and people have done it in the lab, but that is not what happens. So for instance, uh, fast track electronic toll collections. There's no off button. Uh, in California, they're issued with a Mylar bag because people talked about privacy. Now, the, the problem is the way the fast track works is you attach it to your windshield. So in order to get privacy protection with a Mylar bag, you have to take it off the windshield, put it in the bag, and put it in your glove compartment every time you move. Most people don't do that. Now, what we've seen happen, however, is those databases have actually been subpoenaed for use in divorce trials. That is, the divorce lawyer wants to know that, oh, you were with your mistress on such and such date, and she lives in such and such place. I will subpoena the records from your toll uh, plaza, and I will be able to establish you at least were in this part of the state at this time. Or, for instance, policemen have used this kind of information in criminal investigations. These databases are being used today. And the question is, will we have notice and choice about and will we have control over that data? Yes. So, but more, more generally, is the stuff you have on these RFIDs, is it all, all this data? Or can you, is there a compelling reason to have executable code that would be uploaded to either on your behalf? You could. Uh, I'm not aware of any that have executable code at this point. The ones that have more than just a unique identifier, in the electronic passport, it was because it had to work anywhere in the world, even if the reader is offline. In the credit card company, they were working with some legacy systems that required your name and credit card information. Um, it, it, that, the answer to your question is very application dependent, unfortunately. But I still, still think that even if it's just a unique identifier, it's still an issue, especially if you don't have a good way of turning it off. So the question is, you know, can we do better? And, and part of my talk will be to tell you about two ways in which we can do better on notice and choice and control over the data. But let me just briefly talk about some existing techniques. This is not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of work out here. This is just some very widely known things I want to talk about and before moving on to some new ideas. So one thing that's happened in the retail space is a kill command. You tell the tag to die, and then it never talks to you again. Uh, so this is actually in the Walmart type tags. This was implemented as part of a response to consumer privacy concerns. Uh, and it's great if you never need to tag again. It's not so good for library books, for student IDs, for employee IDs, or anything else where you need to use the tag on a continual basis. Has anybody actually found a walking through the aisles of Walmart with kill? Uh, <laughs> not yet, not yet. But a, a, a better question is, has anyone ever seen a, div a, a store that actually kills tags on checkout? And the answer to that is not yet either. 
Does the kill command have any obvious advantage against diagonal cutters? <laughs> diagonal, you mean like physically cutting? Physically cutting the chip in two. So no, there's nothing against that. And actually, IBM has, a, has this thing they call the, the clip tag, where they actually have a perforation, so you can tear the tag in half. Yeah. Uh, so the reason for that is that if it's just a software kill, you can't tell by looking at it if it's dead or not. Uh, and so the sec second thing that's come up, and I've already alluded to this earlier with the Mylar bag, is a shield device. So for instance, the, we're about to issue, the United States is about to issue a border crossing card between the United States and Canada. Uh, unlike the e-passport, it only contains a unique identifier. But also unlike the e-passport, it'll be readable from 20 feet away. So the Department of Homeland Security and Department of State say it's not a problem because we'll give everyone an aluminum foil shield that they can use to shield it when not in use. Uh, and this is a problem because it puts the burden of pr protecting privacy on the user. It also turns out that people lose these shield devices, or they'd never get them in the first place, or just using them is very inconvenient. Sorry? So the, is it possible to, but I always put my credit cards in my wallet in my back pocket, like probably 95% of men. Yes. Who so you have can credit cards. So is there a way that I can have something you know, in my wallet that is interfering, or somehow it doesn't have to be a shield. It could be some interference. Or Aluminum foil. Yes, so aluminum foil. How, how, how big does the shield have to be? It has to enclose the entire card. Okay. So if there's even a little bit left out, then the, then the signal can get, well, mm. this is one of those black art type of things. So I can tell you my entirely unscientific experience with a potato chip bag and a Prius key fob. <laughs> I've found it has to completely wrap around the key fob in order to work. Um, Levi's could build. You know, a special pocket for these sorts of things, right? Yes, and people are already building uh, wallets, special Mylar line wallets, oh, yes. Okay. Which frequency band are those tag working? Uh, it depends on the application. For the northern border card, 915 megahertz. For credit cards, 15.56 megahertz. Sorry, 13.56 megahertz. Do you need a purchase license before you use those? No, they're unlicensed. The 13.56 is the uh, International Scientific and Medical Band, and there's no license needed. Uh, for the 915, it actually differs between Europe, Japan, and America, but they're all unlicensed. Sorry, you had a question, or? I was curious about, like, I mean, we kind of alluded to one problem, too, is like being tagged and not known about yeah. it. Yeah. That's true. So, I mean, I guess, how do we solve that problem? Um, better labeling and better notice, and uh, pressure on manufacturers to tell you if something has an RFID in it. Yes? What would, what would it take on the weaker devices to have at least a, a counter of how many times it's been read? So if you're really careful, you know there's a funny reading that, doesn't, that shouldn't happen. So my understanding from talking to people who work uh, at a certain 915 megahertz manufacturer is actually the counter is harder than crypto, and that's because changing state requires more power. So it, it's, it's actually, it looks better to have a stateless device that has like a stream cipher than to have something with a counter. And, and this came up because I wanted to do like a PRG with a counter and, you know, for, for what I'll discuss in a second. Yes? Uh, are many of these read only? Mm, some of them are, some of them aren't. Uh, the, pa the northern border card is read only. The e-passport is currently read only. The credit card is read only. But they don't have to be. For instance, the Oyster card in London keeps track of where you've been during that day. And the reason they do that is because they have fair rules that say if you've done a certain number of transfers, and you don't get charged so much. Uh, I'm sorry to be so out there, but the answer really is it depends. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two new pieces of work that I and my collaborators have done. Uh, so the first one is I want to talk about the idea that every time the RFID is read, it gives you a different identity. So we call this a pseudonym. It's a new ID every time. So instead of being able to track someone by their license plate, think of it as their license plate changes every two seconds. If you know a special secret, you can tell who it is. But if you don't, if you're just someone eavesdropping, then you can't. Mm -hmm. Now, one, and I'll talk about a, a way of doing this, sort of a straw man. And I'll show that fails, or it becomes inefficient when we have many RFIDs. And this is a problem because Real instances have had as many as a million RFID tags. The University of Nevada Las Vegas Library, for instance, has tagged on a million books. Uh, and then I'll talk about an extension where I can give you limited time access to my RFID. I can give you some delegation. And then we'll switch gears and we'll talk about the reader side. We'll say, OK, we've been talking about the tags. 
Now let's talk about how do we know these readers are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And I'll talk very briefly about using trusted computing to uh, enhance RFID privacy. So here's the first technique, pseudonyms. We have Alice, we have the Cheshire Cat, we have a book. Alice is the owner of the book. The Cheshire Cat is listening in. And Alice sees a particular ID from the book the first time it's read. And so Alice happens to know that that ID probably means that it's Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. She reads it again, and she gets another ID. And she says, oh, OK, it's still Les Mis. But the Cheshire Cat doesn't have any information about the book. He's never read Victor Hugo before or something. So he sees these two different IDs, and he doesn't even know if they're from the same book. So we have the tag on the book is giving a different ID each time. Alice is authorized to know what the book is, so she can tell the same, but the Cheshire Cat can't. So here's the first try. And I'm going to need a little piece of cryptography called a pseudorandom function. And what this is, is it's a function that takes two arguments, a key and an input. And the idea is that if you don't know the key, then it looks like a random function. You won't be able to predict the outputs. You won't be able to figure, distinguish it from a random function. We'll give every single tag a different key, and Alice knows all the keys. So if there's a million books, there's a million keys, one for each book, and Alice knows all of them. So the first try is the tag can pick some random input, and it can send, the p it can send this pseudorandom function of that input keyed with its special key. And then Alice can tell for any given uh, one of these pseudonyms whether or not it matches a particular book. She just says, oh, I am going to check that. It's, is this book five? I'll look up the key for book five, and I'll see if that, that function evaluated on this particular random value gives me the correct answer. People following so far? Basically, because Alice and the tag share a secret, the tag can keep sending random looking values, and Alice can figure out which tag it is. But there's a little bit of a problem here. Which, ta which key should you use? The whole point is Alice doesn't know which book it is, so she doesn't know which key to use. So the obvious thing to do is try each key in turn. This will take a while if there's a million or more. Even if you have a very fast machine, you may want to identify tens or hundreds of tags going by. Yes? You remember on the low side, I think Gillette bought half a billion tags for their operation. They did. They did. But any individual reader might only see you know, hundreds at one time. But yes, Gillette. Yeah? Is the reason for not just using public key performance? Yes, okay. performance. We want to use something that's only a symmetric uh, key cryptography because of performance and power issues. Sorry, you had a question? So this is a problem called, you can think of as private authentication. How do you and I sh determine we share a secret without actually revealing a secret to the adversary? Uh, so here's the solution we came up with. It's a tree of secrets. Uh, if some of you have seen multicast encryption, you may have seen something very much like this. It's very s conceptually simple. Think of each of the leaves there as a different tag. And we build a full binary tree. Each node is a different secret. The tag knows the secrets from the root to the leaf. Alice knows all the secrets. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this tree structure to allow us to walk down the tree to find the individual tag. Uh, and so here's how we generate a pseudonym. We start off each of the keys from the tree is going to key a different pseudorandom function. So then we pick a random number as an input to each of these functions, and we string them together. And we output the result. Alice, n when she gets a pseudonym, she doesn't know which leaf it is. But she can tell, is it the left secret or the right secret at the root? And then once she's checked that, she just walks down the tree and says, OK, is it the left secret or the right secret at the next level? And she can do that. She can walk down the tree just by checking these PRF values until she gets to the particular identity of the tag. And of course, it does, nothing says it has to be a binary tree. You can change the branching factor and optimize and do whatever you want. So yes? In the problem of cloning, right? Uh, actually, I'll t yes. You can replay. I'll get to this in a second. But the thing is, you can replay old pseudonyms, but you can't create new ones. 
And the reason is that because it's a pseudorandom function, you won't be able to predict the output of the function in the future. Uh, and I'll talk about why that's an interesting trade-off in a bit, or why I think it's a, a acceptable trade-off in a bit. But before we get there, I want to mention that this second piece of the puzzle is delegation. I want to give you some of the secrets, but not all of them. I want to give you some ability to read my tag, but not all the time. Uh, and there's two reasons. One is uh, maybe I'm letting you borrow my book. I want you to be able to uh, read the book RFID for a while, but then you give it back to me. So if you're a library, for instance. Uh, but the second thing is um, if I have a reader out there in the field or in a, a store, stores get broken into and people make off with things. So I want to limit my exposure if something is broken into or compromised. So the way we do that is every single tag will have its own delegation tree. Every tag will have a counter. So this does require a counter. This requires more than the previous approach. And every time the tag is read, the counter increments. And it yields a different path in the tree. And we do this, we actually use a GTM construction. Very simple uh, thing that's already been used many times before. Uh, but the main idea is it's easy to derive a, a ch children given a parent, and it's hard to derive a parent given the children. So this is sort of a system level view. You have Alice on one hand. She gives two different parts of her tree to the two different readers. And then the RFID tag outputs a different path each time it's read. So after a while, reader A's tree will just expire. So you can see in the right-hand side, reader A is sort of the left-hand part of the tree, and the reader B is the right-hand subtree. Yes? After a time, no. keeping track of time is even harder than keeping a counter. I, should have, I misspoke. I meant after a number of reads. So over time, the tag will be read many times, and eventually ta reader A's tree will expire. Because you'll simply, here it's four times, and then the tree expires. It will no longer be producing pseudonyms that it understands. So the benefits of this approach that I've talked about is um, because the IDs it generates look just like a standard RFID, you don't change installed readers. That is, if you have a fast track reader that's used to seeing a 32-bit identity from a car, you can use this to upgrade to something that preserves privacy while at the same time not having to go all over the highways and change every single reader. Uh, it foils tracking and hot listing because you have a different identity every time. You won't be able to correlate two sightings of the same tag. And as we heard earlier, you can replay old pseudonyms. So it doesn't get around cloning entirely. But it means that you can't ever create new pseudonyms. So if you have a backend that looks at all the pseudonyms you've seen and looks for commonalities, then you can mitigate that. Yes? So just a resource question. Um, how hard is it to get good pseudorandom number generators? Pseudorandom number generators turn out to be hard. It turns out that it, several technologies have hardware generators, like unbalanced diodes and things that you can deal with. Uh, th those are they're both difficult. It turns out that in an ideal world, I went and talked to one of these RFID manufacturers. In the ideal world, they'd like to see a completely deterministic stateless protocol. I had to tell them that that's a little difficult to do and still get the kind of security to which we become accustomed. Uh, but hardware random number generators turn out to be somewhat more feasible. And compared to maintaining state? Yes, compared to maintaining state at these long range distances. For instance, the new electronic product code, the generation two, actually requires a pseudorandom generator because their uh, collision avoidance protocol is randomized. Are the, are the generators any good? Probably not. Okay. If I get it right, they require either pseudorandom or random. I believe the standards are... That's okay. true. It, it, is, uh, it is a little ambiguous. And what I'm told is actually a, a linear feedback shift register. But it's not great, unfortunately. But, uh, but I'm told that that's actually better. They think it's better than having to keep state. Uh, and the other, and of course, the nice thing is it scales logarithmic the number of tags. Yes? So do you get a probabilistic currency out of this? What's sort of the form of sort of the scheme for generating pseudonyms? What's the currency you get? What, the, what's the currency I get? No, what's the guarantee? The guarantee? Oh, uh, you can guarantee that if it's a valid tag, it will always be identified. There's a small possibility you'll identify other tags as well due to collisions, but it's very small. It's negligible. And then uh, if it's not the valid, if it's not the correct tag, then assuming there's, you're not being uh, attacked by a replay attack, 
then the chance that you get a collision in all of the different places is small. And you can, you can calculate this. Uh, but the downsides, well, for one thing, if you delegate to readers, the, it turns out that the, the overhead of the reader after delegation is linear in the number of total tags delegated. We think this is usually going to be small, but it's still an issue because they don't have the full tree. They only have these uh, subtrees. And the, the big problem with this approach is tag share keys. This isn't an issue for impersonation and cloning because every tag has at least one key that no other tag does. But it's an issue for privacy because if I have tag A and tag B and they share some keys and I break into tag A, I can now tell tag B shared some of those keys. So this tree structure actually has an interesting trade-off between privacy under tag compromise and efficiency. And there have been at least two works that have looked at trying to quantify how much privacy that is and trying to figure out what does it mean to quantify privacy. There's been a work that was done this past uh, summer on how best to structure trees to limit this loss. And then uh, Domgar and Ostergar talked about is there a lower bound into how well we can do. They got some very basic results. Um, but it's still a pretty open problem as to how far you can go with this approach. And then there's an alternative approach via pre-computation that works reasonably well, but only if you uh, plan to read about uh, each tag at most 16 times. So that, that's the pseudonyms that I've talked about. That's our idea. And then I'm going to sort of switch gears again. Let's talk about the reader. So I've talked about making the tag responsible for privacy and saying, OK, the tag gives a different ID each time. You can't track the tag. You can't link two items together. Now I'm going to turn around and say, OK, we have these readers. So Marks and Spencer is going to be pr putting up readers in its uh, stores. And it's going to t promise you that they will only read Marks and Spencer RFID tags. How do you know? Uh, our answer is you're going to leverage some f features of trusted computing. So just to recap, in trusted computing, the si si situation is we have a small trusted platform module. It's installed in your motherboard. You can't break into it, but you can control the entire rest of the computer. And we are going to need two features in particular. One's remote attestation, where you can tell people what software you're running. And the other is sealed storage, where you can tell the trusted platform module, I want you to lock this blob of information and only decrypt it for the particular software that I tell you to. You're going to do remote attestation and not bother with public key? Remote attestation is hideously inefficient. This is for the reader, where we don't care about efficiency. So we can do everything. We do privacy CA. We can do Lysianska stuff. That's going to do the protocol with the RFID, isn't it? No, because what's happening is the protocol here is between a reader and an auditor, me and you and my handheld. But that, that, that's fine for Mark Spencer or whoever, but if I'm just a rogue with a yes. reader out there, right? This does not handle rogue readers. This only deals with policy compliance for nice people. And then you have to do other things like um, listen for bad emanations from rogue readers and find and destroy them. Mm. It's not a complete solution. Yes. Try that at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. <laughs> Don't they already have people doing that, listening for rogue emanations all the time? I get them all the time. Yes. At probably the megawatt level. Yes, probably true. Um, so this is a very limited solution, but I still think it's an interesting for the because we will see legitimate enterprises deploying these readers all over the place, and we want to know what kind of data they're keeping about us. So. This is a basic idea that we had, and we published a position paper sort of saying this is how it might look like. Uh, my colleagues at British Telecom have now got actual implementation, uh, and it kind of works. So the basic idea is you have sort of two services. You have a policy agent, policy engine, and a consumer agent. The policy engine encodes things like, I only read Marks and Spencer's tags, or I only read tags on alternate Tuesdays. Or I only read tags that have a certain privacy bit set to off. And the consumer agent is just a logging engine. The policy engine also keeps track of any shared secrets. So we can support cases where the RFID tag needs some secrets, like in the pseudonym protocol we talked about. And then there's a reader core that just basically interfaces between those two and the TPM. And you can think of it as including the Linux kernel and so on. You could. You could. Or the uh, Windows kernel, yes, Windows kernel, thank you. Uh, 
But the basic idea is something that we've already heard. Uh, the ver you think of a privacy auditor, and it could be you, it could be me, it could be a third party like the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Anyone who in the world who wants to check if this box is actually doing what the sign says it's doing, walks up to it and asks the box to perform remote attestation. And then the box will say, oh, look. I'm running this consumer agent. This consumer agent will give you this log. You know I'm running the correct software. So even if you're not allowed to see what my policy is, my cons the consumer agent that you picked out will tell you it meets your criteria. So it's doing remote attestation of a set of software, but you have no way of knowing if it doesn't have a second set of modules that that's what, when talking to RFID chips. That's uh, what the sealed storage is for. So the idea is that you then take all of the inputs from the RFID and you seal them so they can only be opened by that set of software. I guess I'm thinking of, of an attack where I have one box, mm -hmm. which has two separate things. It is a TPM with doing everything it should right. and something else that's rogue. And you're saying, well, there's a box there, and it's a good box, so I don't mind emanations from that box. That's right. And that's, that's an issue that you'd have to solve by saying, OK, can you make sure that the reader core is only binding to one RFID reader? I don't know how to solve that. Um, so, but the benefit, you know, as we've already talked about, anyone can audit it. You can arbitrarily compli complicated policies. And the sealed storage can keep track of secrets like what, what readers, I, what things I've seen, or what uh, secrets I need. But the downside is it doesn't address rogue readers, even rogue readers in the same box. And changing policy after deployment turns out to be a nasty problem, because you may have had some assumptions about what those policies were, and now you're using sealed storage. So if you change any of the software, underlying <laughs> software, then you're in trouble. Uh, so one thing that I've been thinking about a little bit, though, is you know, why is anyone going to use these technologies? Right? So I've given you two new privacy-enhancing technologies. And will they be used? Why or why not? And um, well, I don't think this is a question computer scientists can answer alone, because it has to do with what actual people implementing RFID need and want. And uh, there are a lot of broken bodies on this road. We are all familiar with technologies that looked great and got people very excited, but then never made it to implementation. And regrettably, privacy-enhancing technologies have a lot of broken bodies, more than usual. So I'm going to sketch one way of thinking about why you might want something like this. Uh, and this is just a work in progress, so I welcome your feedback on this, even if to say it's uh, full of it. So let's think of a simple killing game. So this is game in the economic sense of game. So recall that there's this uh, feature called the kill command in RFIDs, where you can say, at the point of sale, I want this device to be dead. Kill it. And we're going to say, oh, the customer can either buy an item or not buy an item that has an RFID tag in it. And the merchant can kill it or not kill it. We'll just assume the customer benefits from a dead RFID, and the merchant benefits from a live RFID. Like he doesn't want to bother with killing it, or he thinks he can sell the information later. And we'll make an assumption, final assumption, the customer can't tell if the RFID is actually dead. So this is actually pretty close to today. The merchant doesn't want to spend the money to buy a killing device. I can't tell the thing is dead. So. And there are other reasons for the merchant not to kill it. If it's returned, they want it to be alive again. Exactly, exactly. So you want, there are good reasons why this might model reality a little bit. So you can build a payoff matrix, as we all you know, know and love from economics. And that's a payoff matrix. Uh, and um, perhaps this won't be surprising by now, but the equilibrium point for this payoff matrix uh, turns out to be don't buy and don't kill. <laughs> it turns out this is an example of what George Akerlof got the Nobel Prize for. It's a market for lemons. That is, there are good merchants who will kill, and there are lemon merchants who won't. And the customer can't tell the difference. So you just sort of look at the possibilities, and it turns out that the Nash equilibrium is for the all merchants to not kill, since they know I can't tell, and for me to not buy, since I know they can't tell that I, and yeah. Yes? This is not really crypto, but sociology. Some merchants have 100 or 200 years worth of reputation to, to lose. And uh, that may, may change the game. Because if, they, if, they, if, if it leaks, it will ultimately be 
brought back as a merchant. Yes, that's right. And, and in economics, they talk about repeated games as a way of capturing that kind of reputation. If you think you're going to have to play again in the future. Uh, but I want to focus on a slightly different economic issue, and that's the issue of signals. So uh, the economist uh, Michael Spence talked about this notion of a signal to get out of this problem. So the thing is, uh, the original game was in the context of used cars dealerships. Now, as we all know, people actually do buy cars from used car dealerships. So there's got to be something going on that over and above the small game I just talked about. He talked about, well, what if you have a notion of something that a player can either buy a signal or not buy a signal? But if the player is bad or if the player is going to screw you in the, second, in, in the game, the signal costs a great deal. But if the player is good, it doesn't cost very much at all. And he was able to show that if the costs work out, only the good people will buy the signal and all the bad people won't. And his example was a college degree. So as many people know, the fact that you have a piece of paper may or may not mean very much about what you learned. But the fact that you're willing to spend the effort, the time, and you know, the money to get one is probably a signal that you have some effort and time. And so the idea is, could trusted computing be an RFID signal? Because in order to break the, tr in order to send a bad signal, do you have to break the tamper resistance on the trusted platform module? Uh, and my colleague Nikita Borisov, who I, I know some of you may know, you know, he always asks me, well, how much tamper resistance is enough? You know, the TPM may be enough for protecting a song, but is it enough for protecting the reputation of a 200-year-old company? I don't know. But just to recap, these applications are widespread. They're increasing. We're about to roll out a new northern border card that uses RFID. We've been rolling out payment cards that use RFID. And we have electronic passports today that use RFID. And in many of these cases, there are security and privacy problems. And I've mentioned you know, cloning, tracking, and hot listing. And they just keep coming up. And I've talked about two approaches, a pseudonym protocol and a trusted RFID reader that we might be able to use to help us with these. Uh, and this is just where to learn more. This is certain people's theses. And um, uh, there's an RFID bi bibliography that Gilles S.F. Wan holds. It's a really amazing resource. It has pretty much every paper that's been published in the last four or five years on this topic, most of them online links, too. Uh, are you done writing? Or? I'm just writing it down. OK. And if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, I would just say pick up the paper. You know, see what kind of deployments people have. And then you can get readers for quite a small amount of money for the um, near, near term stuff, the 13.56 megahertz stuff. And then you just go out and start reading things. Uh, and then beyond RFID, it's just one slide about why I'm here and why I'm visiting Patrice. Uh, I'm now focusing on finding bugs without human oversight. I'm now more interested in software security. I think RFID is a great area, but I I've also think that it's starting to reach a little bit of diminishing returns. I want to find more things. And I'm particularly interested in catching signed and unsigned conversion bugs. And I have an approach that I'd be happy to talk to anyone about uh, where I try to infer type information on binaries and then use a SAT solver to try to generate test cases that uh, exhibit such bugs. And I look forward to hearing more from all of you about what you've been doing. So that's it. That's my talk. And if you have any questions, let me know. Yes? To return to the question I brought you privately on, how much CPU power do you need for all this stuff? And how much is available in these various RFID chips? Because I heard 100 hertz arm. And in one experiment, I didn't like it. OK, so for my pseudonym protocol, you need a pseudorandom function. So think of AES. Think of something like that. There's been a group at the University of Graz in Austria that can get an AES implementation about 3,000 gates. So that's Martin Feldhofer, F-E-L-D-H-O-F-E-R, and his students. They, uh, they've been really aggressively working on minimizing the gate counter for AES. And then you could use my protocol. Um, but in general, it, it, you basically have to ask about a specific chip and a specific application. Yeah. Any more questions? Great. Thanks very much. <laughs>